Well, dear chairs, dear organizer, thank you very much for having me invited to this really excellent conference here uh, and this beautiful city. I'm totally impressed, I have to say. Uh, and my only disclosure is that I'm unfortunately not an oncologist, but only a cardiologist. So all this science, this beautiful science you present, I don't understand. But I have many friends in the audience here who tend to explain me what the issue is. One of the issue is your success. You are really successful, and that's great. Your patients survive, but some of the problem that arises with that is that we now see cardiotoxicity, so cardiac problems after cancer therapy. And one of the important issue here is that this is something which comes late, late after the treatment, but the problem occurs during the treatment. And that's the reason why we like so much to talk to you, so that we together can prevent the damage in these patients. And I, as a cardiologist, am active in this area for about 20 years now, and uh, had the privilege to work together on, with you on many, many trials. And one of the important, probably most important message I convey to you is talk to your local cardiologist. Because what will happen in the future is that this becomes even a bigger issue. Many of the new drugs which you are discussing now are actually having side effects of the heart, on the heart. Keep in mind, the heart is a post-mitotic organ, so that means whatever cells are damaged or actually die are not being replaced. And this is also the reason why in the evolution, the heart developed survival mechanisms to survive without mitosis. And some of these survival mechanisms are now the target in your cancer treatment. So you will inevitably have side effects on the cardiovascular systems, even with some of the newer, uh, of the newer uh, treatments. Now, just want to quickly point out this paper here. This is a new guidelines, a consensus paper of the European Society of Cardiology. It has a very good representation in Russia. And if it's not yet published, it will be published in September. It will be presented in Rome this year in September. But I'm more than happy, as soon as it is published, to send it to you if you are interested or anyone in your hospital or in your clinic is interested in this topic. There's a lot of good information in here. Also, let me say this clearly. We see about 500 cardio-oncology patients per year in our clinic in Bern. We're more than happy to help you. If you have young people who are interested in this topic, send them to Bern. We host them, we will teach them, and then we hopefully can spread the word. Now here you see all the cardiovascular side effects the cancer treatment can cause. And they're actually quite numerous, but we focus on cardiac dysfunction and cardiotoxicity for the next few minutes. Now, one important point here is that if you see these patients, and you would see them particularly in the acute phase, so when you treat your patients for the cancer, that you differentiate between heart failure and cardiac dysfunction. And the, real, the reason why this is so important is, with heart failure, it is always a very dangerous condition. And you should think if you can continue cancer treatment in this context. However, if you have cardiac dysfunction on the right side, this may be something you can deal with and you can continue the cancer treatment. Heart failure is something you typically know. It's typically due to the pump dysfunction of the heart and the patient has symptoms such as dyspnea, ortho, orthopnea, or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Cardiac dysfunction is something different. And this is actually uh, data from the HERA trial of which I was part of. You see this woman here, this is an echocardiogram and the LV ejection fraction. She starts with 68% LV ejection fraction, which is normal. Everything is normal above 
percent, 55 percent. And then during treatment, this is during trastuzumab treatment, she drops her LV attraction fraction to the 40s. And we didn't stop treatment with her, and look what happened. She recovered and was actually quite fine. And I come back to that. That's very important to differentiate these two situations. Again, heart failure is always very, very dangerous. So if your patient all of a sudden has dyspnea, think about the heart. This is dangerous. The patients die because of that. Cardiac dysfunction, just the drop of the pump function in the heart without symptoms is frequently something we can manage, a very important issue. And that brings me to a concept that was actually invented by Mike Heuer, the good friend and colleague of, uh, uh, of us both uh, from MD Anderson. This is some of the drugs cause type 1 cardiotoxicity, and this is the bad situation which you want to avoid. This is typically anticyclines. These cancer drugs kill myocytes, and again, these myocytes are not being replaced. Whereas type 2 cardiac dysfunction drugs cause a cardiac dysfunction which does not lead to cell death, and we can usually treat these patients. And this is a table which is not very comprehensive, but useful for your daily uh, activities. So in red here, you see the type 1 cardiotoxic drugs. By and large, these are anthracyclines. We as cardio cardiologists, we don't like anthracyclines. We hate them because they kill the heart. And then in green are the type, one, type 2 cardiotoxic drugs. You see these are by and large the signaling inhibitors here, breast cancer, and you see the incidence. And then we have some, for example, protease inhibitors where we see a high rate of cardiac dysfunction, but we really don't know what that means. And we have to learn more about this. Now let's quickly talk about type 1 and by and large anthracycline cardiotoxicity. You see there are other drugs here too, but that's not to indicate that they are also type 1 cardiotoxic drugs. They just mean that they worsen the situation of anthracyclines. Here you see also, for example, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and that indicates that if you give these drugs together, trastuzumab together with doxorubicin, that's bad because the doxorubicin cardiotoxicity gets much worse. Now what is important to know, and this is only on one slide, what is important to know about anthracycline cardiotoxicity? You see here the important risk factors. The most important point is how much anthracyclines you give. And you see here a curve, the original von Hoff curve, and modified by Swain and colleagues. And you see here the incidence of heart failure, and here the dose of doxorubicin. And you see that about 400 milligram is okay to give. But if you give more than 400 milligrams doxorubicin per meter square, the risk that these patients get in trouble, that these patients develop heart failure, is exponentially increasing. Another thing what you see here is elderly patients, here in red versus younger patients, and elderly patients defined as over 65 year old. Elderly patients have a higher risk, it's about two times as high as a younger patient. So be extremely careful with elderly patients, this is by the way also true for children, but that's not the topic. But, again, the cardiotoxicity of anthracycline is something which is late. You see here, for example, free of heart failure, and this is adjuvant breast cancer, that's the Sears data bank, and you see that in yellow, this is an anthracycline-free chemotherapy, and in gray, it's an anthracycline-containing chemotherapy. And you see that the curves separate after about seven years. So that's when we see the patient. We see them after five years to 10 years after the in initial cancer treatment. Uh, and then they get in trouble with their heart. And this is, by the way, the same for Hodgkin patients. The story behind it is complicated, and it's a very complicated slide, 
and I will not go into details, I bear it. But an important point is how much oxidative stress you have in the heart. The heart doesn't like stress, and the heart particularly doesn't like oxidative stress. It causes an array of differences in the heart, and if you push it up too much, this oxidative stress, you kill myocytes. And if you kill myocytes, it's, no matter how, this is the bad news for the heart. Again, remember, heart cells that are killed are not replaced. You know this from myocardial infarction. If a patient has a myocardial infarction, this tissue is not replaced. So we should do whatever we can to prevent myocardial cell deaths. And what can we do in the cancer treatment? Well, we have several options. If you choose to use anticyclines, and I'm, a pro, pro, I, I'm always for doing whatever you can do to treat your patients, that's your, your duty. Obviously, limitation of the dose, don't give as much anticyclines, the minimal dose that you can live it. Continuous infusion would be an option. That means instead of giving bolus anticyclines over 20 minutes, give it over hours, ideally over 72 hours, 96 hours. We know this from sarcoma data. The problem is no one is doing that. And for me, honestly, the, the, at the moment, best option is if you try to use anticyclines and you have a patient who has at risk for cardiotoxicity, use a liposomal formal form of, of doxorubicin, which, because it's clearly not that cardiotoxic as the free doxorubicin. Less anticyclines, uh, toxic anticyclines is very controversial. It's controversial if epirubicin, for example, is less cardiotoxic than doxorubicin. I do not believe so and you can read this in the Cochrane analysis. Dexoroxan is one of the options, but I think it's not available in Russia, and in Europe it's only available for patients who have been treated with anticyclines with more than 350 milligrams per meter square. So that's type one cardiotoxicity. Now let's talk about type two cardiotoxicity, and this is by and large, the signaling inhibitors, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, TDM1, all these beautiful new drugs that you are using now. Again, it is by and large reversible. What you see here on the right side, the incidence of heart failure, this is typically acute heart failure, and you see here the incidence of cardiac dysfunction. And keep in mind with trastuzumab, any anti-HER2 treatment, you will see cardiac dysfunction in up to 20% of your patients. So that's really frequently, really frequently. Now, the mechanism of this anti-HER2 cardiotoxicity oops, uh, depends on what regimen you choose. For example, if you look at trastuzumab registration trials here, this is the NSABP B31, and you look at the incidence of cardiac dysfunction, it is substantially higher than, for example, what we had in HERA, where it was actually acceptable low. And what is the main difference here? The main difference here is the chemotherapy, and immediately after chemotherapy, you start trastuzumab or pertuzumab. Here in HERA, we had a break for almost three months, and that's the main reason why you see lower cardiotoxicity. And that's another key message that I want to give you. If you have a patient who is at risk for cardiotoxicity, try to delay the signaling inhibitors as much as possible. And the reason is actually in the, in the pathophysiology, and I come back to that. The good thing about this cardiac dysfunction is, by and large, they are reversible. All the data indicate that about 80% of the patients who have this cardiac dysfunction are reversible and are fine in the long run. We have looked at this quite carefully in HERA, but also in NSABB B31. These patients are not at risk for cardiotoxicity in the long run. 
Now, the story, the pathophysiology of anti-HER2 cardiotoxicity is here. Actually, the same receptor which you are targeting in the cancer cell is present in the heart, too. And it is quite fascinating to me because what you are using to killing cancer cells here, we are using in the heart that the heart survives. Keep again in mind, the heart is a post-mitotic organ, no cell replacement. So in the evolution, the heart developed strategies to survive. And one of the strategy is actually the HER2 signaling pathway or the neuroregulating pathway. So that means if you inhibit this signaling pathway at times where the heart is stressed, it is bad news for the heart. You will kill heart cells. And that explains why when you combine trastuzumab with anthracyclines at the same time, or you give trastuzumab immediately after anthracyclines, you have a higher rate of cardiotoxicity compared to when you wait a long time or a longer time after the chemotherapy. And these are things you can play with. This is what you can do in your patients to reduce the risk of cardiotoxicity. I should also indicate that in many of the trials, this is for HERA true, for ALTO, for Affinity, for Beatrice, we actually allowed to drop the LV attraction fraction quite substantially. Usually we did not stop cancer treatment unless the LV attraction fraction was below 40%. Keep in mind, 55% is normal. So you have a way where you can play with without getting into trouble and without getting your patients in trouble. But you have to do the right thing. And most importantly, these patients need to be asymptomatic. So this is not true anymore if the patient is symptomatic. So what does that mean in your daily practice? So what I recommend, what you should do is prior to chemotherapy, prior to cancer therapy, I'm also talking about radiation therapy here, assess the risk of your patient. If you have an elderly patient with hypertension, pre-existing cardiac problems, you know this patient has a problem and the risk of cardiotoxicity is substantially higher. During chemotherapy and cancer therapy, you should monitor these patients to identify the patients who get in trouble and then don't forget these patients. Again, many of these problems manifest years after the initial cancer treatment. So don't forget these patients, please. Let's quickly specifically talk about what to do in terms of risk assessment. Here are the risk factors for anthracycline cardiotoxicity. You see the risk factors for trastuzumab, as an example. For trastuzumab cardiotoxicity, they're pretty similar. So try to identify if your patient is at risk or not. Now what we do in Bern is, if we have a patient who has no risk factors, we allow the chemotherapy, in particular if these are young women, and we get an echo done, or you can do a MAGA if you want, an echo done, an assessment of the, of the cardiac function prior to biological therapy, and usually we get an echo done at the end of therapy. However, if a patient has risk factors, that's very important. We want to know before the chemotherapy what the cardiac function is. Because if you have cardiac dysfunction and you treat these patients with anthracyclines, it is very likely that these patients get in, into trouble. So during therapy, you should monitor your patients, ask your patients if they're short of breath. If your breast cancer patient comes to you and says, you know, I just can't climb my stairs at home anymore. Be aware, this could be the heart. I know the first thing is always to think about, well, it's chemotherapy, the patient has chemotherapy, but try to think at the heart. If the patients all of a sudden can't lay flat anymore, think of the heart. This is autopnea, a very important symptom. So look at your patient, assess your patient, look for edema, check the weight. If the weight goes up, that's frequently fluid retention because of heart failure. 
Talk to the cardiologist. If you're not sure, get an echodon so that you know what the LV ejection fraction in this patient is. This is a complicated slide again, but I want to show you what strategies you can apply. This is a young patient, 42-year-old woman with HER2 positive breast cancer. And she had a normal LV ejection fraction. Here again, it's 55%. Whatever is below, it's bad. Whatever is above is good. She had a normal LV ejection fraction to begin with, and her heart was normal in size. And then she had her operation for her breast cancer. You see this stage up here. And she had her chemotherapy. She was started on trastuzumab. Oops, I apologize. That's too fast. OK. She had her uh, trastuzumab and taxol. And all of a sudden, she went into heart failure. And look what happened to her, to her LV ejection fraction. It dropped to 35%. So what do you do with such a patient? This patient is now heart failure, in heart failure. So you should stop treatment here. And that's what our oncologists did. They stopped treatment. So we treated this patient with an ACE inhibitor. And look what happened to the LV ejection fraction. It recovered. It did not recover to normal. But we were confident enough in this patient that we would allow to continue cancer treatment again. So indeed, actually, we continued trastuzumab here in this patient. And look what happened to her heart. She is pretty stable, and she was actually fine. And she could complete her cancer treatment as she needed it. And I can tell you, even five years after now, she is still fine. So again, what I'm saying here is, if you do the right things, if you look at these patients, if you treat these patients, if you support these patients, you can go get through, the, through the, to the chemotherapy. But again, don't forget the survivors. They frequently manifest late, years after the cancer treatment, with their heart problems. And I think it is important. What we do now in Bern is we see all the patients who have been treated with anthracyclines, and we see all the patients who had mediastinal radiation therapy every five years in our cardio-oncology clinic. And I tell you, after 10 years, 15 years, it is stunning how much cardiotoxic effects these patients indeed have. Another thing are the children. The children is a disaster. Most of the children are actually treated with anthracyclines, and 40% of these children children have uh, cardiotoxicity, but that would be something else to discuss. Don't forget the radiation therapy. I know our radiation oncology friends, they always tell us, well, that's all news. Uh, we are better now, but I tell you, it's not true. It is not true. Even with the newer methods of radiation, mainly we see problems at the heart valve, but we also see problems with the coronary arteries. And indeed, this is actually the highest number of patients we see. We see Hodgkin patients 10 years, 15, 20 years after their initial uh, treatment, and most of what they have is radiation-induced cardiotoxicity. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, chairman, try to differentiate about the cardiotoxicity in the bad form, type 1, and in the not-so-bad form, type 2. Try to identify the risk factors of your patients, but keep in mind that much of this cardiotoxicity manifests year after the initial treatment, but the damage treat happens during treatment. If we see them five years later in cardiology clinic, it's too late. We can't do anything anymore. These patients have a very bad prognosis. In patients with type 2 cardiotoxic effects, this is typically during treatment, not like here, it's during treatment. It's typically the signaling inhibitors. You have also risk factors, and we can deal with that. In particularly when we see them early, we can support these patients, and these patients can continue their cancer therapy. But most importantly, do what we have done in Bern. Have a team, talk to your cardiologist, and try to connect. And I think together as a team, we can do the best for our patients. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Дискутант по этому вопросу Николай Владимирович Жуков. Николай Жуков is going to discuss on this very topic.